the following is a live presentation of CBC Sports. The legacy of Lord Earl is the dream of all in the Canadian Football League. A dream that's proved elusive and for some a nightmare. A vision that at times seems to be within grasp only to be stolen away. But the dream never dies. Today, two teams will move one step closer. Okay, so here's the deal. Four teams, one cup, three games left. I don't know about you, but I smell tension. First up, the Southern dust-up as the Texans try to break the Stallions. Four bullseyes and over 300 last time, but this week the roof's open and the heat's turned up high. Saunders bowled his way in for two against the Kudas. He's a must-stop for Baltimore this week. Pringle ran just about wherever he wanted to last time. If he does again, it's a trip all the way to Regina. And hey, don't put this guy in your dance card. He'll step all over you. Alberta bound and deja vu all over again. Eric is the irresistible force. Calgary's D, the unmovable object. This should be interesting. Plus, and the rocking team hope to do some damage today. So who was that guy dressed like Flutie last week? He'll have to rebound. Stewart picked up the slack and sold it Coleman and the D. But it's a notch higher today. This is too good to be true. Somebody pinch me and let's play ball. It's a short road to the Grey Cup now. One more win lands you in the championship game. Two more takes the grand prize, and this is where we stop first today. Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, where the Stallions engage the San Antonio Texans in the South Final, and later we come north to Calgary. Welcome now to Final Sunday on the CFL on CBC. Six hours of championship football. I'm Scott Oak in Calgary. Have not the CFL playoffs turned out just fine. Thank you very much. The league's four best teams set to contest the two division finals. Uh, later here in Calgary, it's that still magical matchup of the Eskimos and Stampeders. But first up, the Texans and Stallions in Baltimore. Mark Lee standing by there. Mark, the odds makers are working overtime on this game. Scott, it's a dandy here in Baltimore. The Stallions winning back-to-back -back games against San Antonio back in July. And Don Matthews says this is the most talented team he has coached in 18 years in the CFL. Listen to Kay Stevenson, on the other hand, and his Texans don't stand a chance. He said of Baltimore, show me where is there a weakness. A little playoff posturing, perhaps, but there is one thing they both agree on. The kicking game and the windy conditions could be a huge factor. Carlos Huerta missed three field goals in windy conditions just like this last week. Week. All week, Baltimore practiced in windy, wet conditions on a natural grass field to get the kicking game right this time around. Chris Cuthbert, James Curry, joining me in the broadcast booth. They'll call today's game. James, we'll start with you. How do they stop Archer? Well, it's really going to be hard to stop David Archer. He has one of the most balanced passing attacks in the entire CFL. He has two young receivers in Mark Stock and Billy Hess who really improved the passing game this year. They do not have a 1,000-yard receiver in the entire court. But the, st the straw that stirs the drink is Mike Sonner who comes out of the backfield. He carries the mail phone, but he's also an equal threat in catching the football. James, his coach, Kay Stevenson, says that the running game and defense will win a championship. He hopes his defense can stop the running of Mike Pringle. Look at the numbers last week, 228 yards in two games against the Texans last year. He's got a little extra to prove because when uh, they were in Sacramento, they let Mike Pringle go. So he's like to remind them that that was a mistake today. Chris, both teams are hot. The Stallions winning 11 in a row coming into this one. The Texans, 9 of 10. Don Matthews saying, hey, I'd pay to see this one myself, Scott. All right, Mark, a year ago, Kent Austin was getting ready to start for the BC Lions in the division final here in Calgary. We welcome back the now Toronto Argonaut quarterback as our game day analyst, his body racked with pain, having just seen a replay of that sandwich hit by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders uh, on you from me. earlier <laughs> in the season. Are you okay, and can you continue? Uh, yeah, I can continue with this broadcast. <laughs> Kent, you don't have to go that far back to realize what a big opportunity yeah. the quarterbacks in today's game and all the players, in fact, are sitting on. Well, as a player right now, all you're thinking about is playing absolutely your best ball game of your life. 
to that end, the, the thing that you need to do is play both loose and aggressive. What I've found in the past, that players that generally are worried about not making mistakes will make mistakes. You know, here in Calgary, Wally Buono is still unwilling to confirm who his starting quarterback will be, either Jeff Garcia or Doug Flutie. Is there any strategy here, and can it work? <laughs> Uh, there may be strategy in Wally's mind. Edmonton's defense is not going to prepare any differently regardless of which two players play. I think that, that uh, they'll give the start to Doug, and rightfully so. All right, Kent, thank you. We'll check in with you from time to time today. And coming up on our Chrysler Canada halftime report on final Sunday, we'll set up the North final between the Eskimos and Stampeders. Doug Flutie has said his contribution to the Stamps this season is not over yet. The betting is number 20 will start for Calgary today. And Edmonton's Willie Pless may have to be as dominant on defense as he was in victory over BC last week. We'll hear from both Pless and Flutie, and we'll analyze the first half of the proceedings in Baltimore with the San Antonio Texans and Salians. We'll enjoy brisk conditions for the South final today. Today. Here again is Mark Lee. Thank you, Scott. The winds are swirling inside the horseshoe here at Memorial Stadium, and the temperature a cool six degrees. The field, though, could be the biggest problem. It's frozen just beneath the surface, and there has been so much water on the field from overnight, it hasn't drained very well, and they had to top dress this natural turf field with something they say is like kitty litter to try to make the track a little bit better. We'll see today our Pringle and Saunders good mutters. Here we go, the South Division final, Chris and James. And good afternoon, everybody, from coast to coast across the country, and you all watching in San Antonio today, the first ever All-American Division final. Keith Stevenson and Don Matthews matched up, and we're underway with Kenny Wilhite taking the opening kickoff from his 20, and Wilhite with a nice return up to the 42-yard line, where San Antonio will start for the first time this afternoon, a 22-yard kickoff. And David Archer engineered a CFL record tying seven touchdowns last week against Birmingham. He's 9-1 in his last 10 starts, averaging over 41 points a game during that stretch. Well, it's going to be very important for David to get off to a nice start early in this game. He can't let the pressure bother him early. He has to be willing to take what Baltimore gives him underneath. Working against a breeze that's as stiff as it was a week ago here in Baltimore on the ground for San Antonio as we set the offense for you. Mike Kislak has played every game in this franchise's history, an all-South player this year at center. Checking the weapons, Keith Sherman, the former Philadelphia Eagle, has moved in for Troy Mills and has been great to Mark Stock in recent weeks, has been the hottest receiver. Pickup of three, so it's second and seven for Archer and the Texans. Has time to throw to Kittrick Taylor. There's a completion down the sideline in front of the Baltimore bench, forced out by Ken Watson. Well, one of the things you want to do against Baltimore in your passing game is that you want to work the wide side of their field. They feel that they have enough team speed to get over, and sometimes they get a little lax in their coverage. 58th consecutive pass thrown by Archer without an interception. And it's a first down for San Antonio at the Baltimore 53. The number three ranked offense during the regular season. Play action. Now he'll try the other out, and Gamble can't hold on. He was jarred from the ball by Douglas Kraft, who last year was in the North Final playing for Calgary. Well, Douglas Kraft is that tenacious hitter that they love to have in the secondary. That time, Gamble, it was a very catchable football. But the hit by Douglas Kraft, and when you're a defensive back, you have to be an intimidator. And he came up and he laid his mark early to let him know he's going to be, be there all afternoon with those tenacious hits. The Baltimore defense against the pass number eight this season. So they've got to come up big. And they feel the key is heat on Archer. Second and ten. Here they come, but Archer gets it away, and Taylor, well covered by Ken Watson. Taylor thinks he was interfered, but no penalty marker on the play. Well, that was a good move by Archer to get Taylor one-on-one. -on -one. They felt that they could pick on Watson this afternoon, but he's a crafty veteran. Watson had good coverage down the field, and the ball was just overthrown. Dave Ewell in charge of proceedings this afternoon, and on third down Todd Jordan in the game and there is Chris Wright who could be the difference this afternoon he returned 169 yards for a touchdown against San Antonio earlier this season Jordan will try and kick it away from Wright who lets it bounce and it goes out of bounds 
inside the 15 yard line and it could be a plus for Chris Wright today with the windy conditions a 39 yard punt no return that time we'll be back with Baltimore's possession after this overwhelming this year but one of the keys to his success this season and against San Antonio there were no turnovers against the Texans there are the numbers last week the one interception didn't hurt him the no turnover that's always the most impressive stat for a quarterback because that means that you're keeping the ball moving you're not giving the opposing team great field position and early opportunities and last week San Antonio capitalized with 31 points off of turnovers versus Birmingham the losing quarterback in 1990 and 94 in the Grey Cup. Tracy Ham looking for another shot. And he'll go to the air on his first play from scrimmage. Almost picked off by the safety, Charles Frank. So Ham going to the air quickly. And we talked about no turnovers, almost one on the initial play. What a great offensive line Tracy Ham has with three all-south players. And last week, Mark Dixon named lineman of the week. Chris Armstrong's been the favorite receiver all season long. And Gerald Alphen, another solid slot back with Mike Pringle, the key man in behind Ham. Second and ten. And Ham steps up. He'll take off with it. And a first down for Tracy Ham. And he got a late block by Robert Drummond as Ham will move the yardsticks. We have not seen him run as much this year, James, but. That's still a great asset he brings to the table. That's always the equalizer for Tracy Ham is his running ability when he cannot find an open receiver down the field. Most of the time, he will not take a chance and throw it in the coverage. He has that great elusiveness coming out of the backfield, and he picks up a first down. Second all-time rusher among quarterbacks in CFL history behind Damon Allen. Former teammates in Edmonton. Damon was the starting quarterback when Tracy broke in. And first and ten, better field position for Mike Pringle's first carry. Not much there up the middle. Pringle may have got to the 35 for a gain of three. The defense nicknamed the Bounty Hunters. And this front four has been together for all 20 games this year for San Antonio. Tommy Smith, an interception last week. Good linebacking core. That'll be essential today against Pringle. And the veteran Bobby Humphrey on the corner. No all-stars amongst the deep backs of the Texans and they kind of took offense to that when the voting came out this week. Well I think what they do is let their playing ability speak for itself this afternoon on the field and they'll actually see. Second and seven. Ham under the gun throwing wide open Shannon Culver and he has it down at the 40 yard line. Ham has not been able to get to his wide outs in recent games. They've been a little unhappy about it, but that's a 35-yard pickup for Shannon Culver. Well, Shannon Culver was actually the one that was outspoken about not receiving enough footballs, and this time, on a simple post route, Tracy Ham puts the ball right on the money. Tracy Ham can throw the deep ball as well as any quarterback in the CFL. Jason Wallace with the stop, but it's a 35-yard gain, and the football now at the Texan 40-yard line. Mike Pringle deep as the lone setback. And the quick up, there's Culver again. Just two catches last week. He has two on the initial Baltimore series against San Antonio. Malcolm Frank, the, the corner, forcing him out of bounds. Out of Those two receptions last week, was, last week, he was also only able to pick up 16 yards. And as you say, on his first reception, it was a 35-yard reception. Look at Don Matthews, who said he learned from his days in Edmonton that this game, a division final, is one that defines the success of your season. Said so the Grey Cup will take care of itself when you get there, but this is the game where you have to make the impact to earn the trip to the championship. Second and five, handoff Pringle up the middle. And to the 30-yard line, which should be enough for the first down. Well, when you look at this power offensive line that Baltimore possesses, five yards is almost a given for Mike Pringle every time he touches the football. They get such a great serve at the initial point of attack and allow him to pick up five and six yards per chunk. Last week, of course, Pringle with 211 yards behind that big offensive line, Subas and Withercombe, Dixon, Pordonish, and Port. Already Baltimore, three for three on second down conversions, and Ham 
to Pringle out of the backfield, and we'll have another first down as they're down to the 17-yard line. Tracy hands pass to Mike Pringle. So a good, crisp opening drive for the Stallion. Early in Mike Pringle's career, he had problems with his hands. He started off in Edmonton, he had fumble problems, and they didn't keep him in that organization. But since coming over here to Baltimore, he's become a sure-handed receiver out of the backfield. You see it's a safety valve picking up the first down. 33 catches on the year for Pringle, 276 yards to go with the league leading 1,791 yards rushing. First down, Baltimore, back to Pringle. And he's hit before he got to the 15. The big middle linebacker, Maurice Miller, who's essential for the Texans today, making the tackle. There's big Maurice, 91 tackles last year. And a sack last week against Birmingham. He was a late arrival in, with the team this year. He spent the training camp with the Atlanta Falcons. But since coming over, he's really shored up the middle of that defense. And this is a big play for him right here, second and long. Here comes the rush. And they got him this time. Back at the 24, it's Tommy Smith from his outside linebacking Tracy position. And he drops him for the first sack of the game. Well, that's what you need defensively when a team drives down in the red zone. That's where your defense has to make the big plays. The bend but don't break theory happened that time for San Antonio. You'll see right here, watch Pringle at the bottom of your screen as Kings just runs him over, picks up the sack on Tracy Ham, forces work in a field goal attempt, and he had a bad game last week, only two for five. And this was the end that gave him the most trouble into the swirling wind. Huerta puts it up, and he's got it through. Huerta did not miss one during the regular season against San Antonio, and he's opened the story in the South Final. Well, even after losing to Baltimore in week three, Cave Stevenson expected this matchup in the South Final. Although he says his Texans should be prohibitive underdogs. He was saying somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 points, which, as Mark mentioned, was uh, a weak attempt at posturing. Well, I think Kay really understands the importance of this game. He wasn't trying to overplay it with his players, but he was trying to keep them more relaxed and let them get into it themselves. Kenny Wilhite, a little trouble picking that one off the frozen turf, but up near the 40-yard line, a 12-yard kickoff return. And I would think... A big relief for Carlos Huerta to get that first field goal out of the way because he admitted last week the wind really played with his mind. It is. It's, it's almost like having a monkey on your back. And kickers are, are finicky type of people. They're like having a cat around your house. You never know what type of reaction you're going to get from them. And for him to get that first kick through, it's going to be a big plus for him as this game carries on. And it even could come down to a kick between the top two kickers in the CFL this season. So the Texans, pretty good field position. And Saunders, not much up the middle. Remember last week, Winnipeg thought they could rush the football straight up the middle, but Demetrius Maxey has really bolstered the defense for Baltimore. He's one of the reasons Don Matthews thinks this is a better team than a season ago with Maxey at strong tackle with Bayless. Peyton, 18 sacks on the year. Tracy Gravely in one meeting against San, San Antonio this year. 13 tackles, and Chris Johnson had an interception last week from the safety spot. Second down, seven, and a pass complete to Billy Hess, and that'll be a first down for Hess, one of the slot backs that's been red hot of late for San Antonio, Ken Watson, the tackle. Well, Billy Hess had the touchdown, two touchdown receptions, make the one touchdown reception last week versus Birmingham, but he's the possession receiver. He's the guy that's underneath that Archer likes to look for. When he can't find anything over the middle, he's out in the flat. Hess and Stock, the rest of them say the great thing about David Archer is he understands what those receivers are thinking. First down, play action, out wide for Gamble, and this time hangs on with Kraft making quick contact on the receiver. And they're back into Baltimore territory. Well, one of the reasons for the addition of Hess and Stock this year to the San Antonio team, this team was really depleted by free agency last year. They lost 13 players in their move into San Antonio from Sacramento, so they really had to rebuild, and it really helped 
to have a great nucleus, the offensive line and quarterback David Archer, for the rest of those young players to rally around. Second and two after the eight-yard pickup by Gamble. And they throw underneath. And Gamble can't hang on. Next defensive play by Ken Watson, who's been active already this afternoon from his defensive halfback position. Well, Ken Watson was picked on last week by Reggie Slack and Gerald Wilcox, and David Archer saw some things there also, but Ken Watson has been equal to the task thus far here in the first quarter. You'll see him arrive just as the ball does and breaks up the pass. Nice play by Ken Watson from his halfback position. A little surprised with that play call on second and two and a pretty good running game in San Antonio. Well, you have Heath Sherman and Mike Saunders in the backfield. Let the big offensive line do the work for you. Todd Jordan in for his second punt. And he'll try and pin Baltimore deep. Good punt driving right back. And this one will bounce through the end zone. And that's a single point. So the San Antonio Texans are on the board thanks to a 60-yard single by Todd Jordan. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. First quarter. And the Stallions with an early lead as they try to return to the Grey Cup for the second straight year. Well, it's always a great advantage to get up when you possess such an outstanding defense such as the Stallions do. You really put the pressure on David Archer. He's taken a lot of hits at the quarterback position in his three-year CFL team career. After the single point, it's a first down at the 35. And him can't find anybody downfield now. Gets it away a completion to Gerald Alpin in front of the Baltimore bench a 20-yard pickup him to Alpin you know early in Tracy Ham's career he probably would have just take off and run with that ball right away but he has the willingness now to stay in the pocket and allow his receivers to do what they're paid to do and that's to find the open spots down the field as Gerald Alpin a late acquisition from Winnipeg does and picks up another first down for Baltimore Alpin had 18 touchdowns last year and on the other side, so did Chris Armstrong. So great weapons for Ham to deal with. Although this team was last in passing this year, but that was more the success of this guy. Mike Pringle off the left side. And he's hit as he crossed midfield at the 51-yard line. Jason Wallace, Tommy Smith combining on the tackle. You know, back to the point about Tracy Ham sitting in the pocket. Tracy Ham has grown up and really developed as a player you know you see the last run by Pringle here as he comes off tackle here as Drummond was trying to get the block for him but the pursuit of the San Antonio defense got to him three yard pickup for Pringle at second and seven and hand to the air rush was on so they outlet to Pringle inside and he'll have the first down at the 41-yard line, Mike Pringle, who's been most effective so far, and it is early, as a receiver this afternoon. But what that does with Mike Pringle as a receiver is that you really don't know how to gauge your pass rush. And you get him out in the flat. That was just a little dump pass at the line of scrimmage, but his elusiveness made, made him avoid a couple of tacklers and pick up adequate yardage for another first down. They've really done well in mixing up the plays here in the first quarter. And it's a first down in San Antonio territory as it's come to Culver. Another catch for Shannon Culver. And he's hit immediately by Jason Wallace. You know, we look at the job that Pringle has done in running the ball and catching the ball, but on that last play, he threw a crushing block to get the defender's hands down so that Tracy Ham could deliver a strike to Culver out in the flat. It's almost as if Baltimore is employing the old Sacramento offensive scheme with Mike Pringle. He actually was more used more as a receiver than a running back in Sacramento's offense a couple of years ago. Ham in trouble and he is down for the second time behind the line of scrimmage. That will bring up third down and with the sack it'll be a test for Huerta. Tackled by you know, what, what created that sack was that the pocket Bring was collapsed equally across the board. Watch the linemen up front as they come. Everyone comes in an equal plane, and that is the key when you're playing against Tracy Ham. You can't give him any escape routes. They collapsed the pocket. A sack was a result for San Antonio. James King 
outdueling Neil Fork to get to the quarterback. And now Hertha to attempt a 47-yarder. This might be out of his range with this win, Chris. The holder, Dan Crowley, the third-string quarterback. And this didn't get there. And surprisingly, Will Height is going to try and run it out. That might not have been the best of decisions. Huerta misses and Grant Carter, the first man downfield to meet Will Height. So the score remains 3-1. San Antonio's backed up. That's one of the things that young players have to realize where they are on the field. And if Will Hyde had kept that ball in the end zone, gave up the single, the ball would have came back out to the original line of scrimmage. Now San Antonio's pinned back with poor field position, and it's really going to be a test right here for David Archer. Can he move this stubborn Baltimore defense? Kenny Will Hyde has returned kicks on occasion for San Antonio this year, but their number one man, Marcus Gates, he is out of the lineup, pulled a groin muscle last week in the win over Birmingham. Well, since they've lost David Lucas, they've been unsettled as far as punt returners go. Back to the ground. Heath Sherman on and the Heath Sherman, the big running back. It's interesting, James. I wanted to say fullback, but they run Saunders out of the fullback position, and sometimes they run... Uh, he's Sherman out of the fullback spot. Well, what these backs do is that they complement each other so well that you really can't get a gauge on who's at which position because neither one minds blocking for the other. And that's a great plus when you have a team mentality, and that's what San Antonio possesses. No superstars, a team mentality. Sherman with six yards on the carry, second and four. Archer stands in, delivers, flag down as the pass is dropped. Tracy Crabley unloaded at Mike Saunders. Incomplete and uh, flag on the play. The penalty going against San Antonio anyway. Well, that's in that area where you're going to get holding, but Baltimore should decline this penalty. But Tracy Gravely doing a wonderful job in covering Mike Saunders out of the backfield. Tracy Gravely is one of those guys. They call him a tweener, but he's not a tweener. He is an actual defensive back playing the linebacker position. He's just big enough to play that position. This defense for Baltimore employs only two down defensive linemen, three linebackers, and seven defensive backs. It is built for speed, and they do an excellent job of executing their assignments. So Todd Jordan back in. In the first meeting between these two teams, a bad snap down near the end zone caused San Antonio a safety. And every play will be critical in that department. The low snap delivered, but they take a time count violation. But in a championship game with evenly matched teams, it could come down to that one bad snap. Well, what they were trying to do with Jordan on that play, they only needed three yards to pick up the first down. They were trying to induce Baltimore into that neutral zone and hopefully pick up the first down. But the time count violation really shouldn't hurt because he has the wind in his back, and Jordan can equally get off, easily get off a 45 to 50-yard punt under these type of conditions. We saw a 60-yarder for the single point. There's Chris Wright. What Kay Stevenson's worried about, though, with the wind is you can't always control where it's going, so your cover men are running downfield unsure of where the ball's going. So it might be advantage Chris Wright. Bad kick by Jordan. No return, but that won't matter. Ball's out at the San Antonio 21-yard line. 21-yard punt by Todd Jordan. That bad kick was evidence of how important Chris Wright is and how dangerous he is because he makes you adjust your kicking game, and that bad kick was a result of Chris Wright. And this bad field position, a result of Kenny Wilhite's decision not to give up the single point. It may cost San Antonio a lot more as Pringle runs inside the 25. Early Brown the tackle, and let's find out what happened to Jordan. Well, you'll see right here, he's trying to angle it off to the right, and that's one of the problems when you have a right-footed kicker. Never try to angle the ball to your right. Always angle it to your left, because if you shank it, it goes down the middle of the field. If you shank it when you're trying to angle it to the right, it's going to go right out of bounds. Great field position for Baltimore. Second and two for Mike Pringle, and he's got that a whole lot more. 
And they need all of the bounty hunters just about to bring him down. After he moves the sticks. Tackled by Roosevelt Collins. Pringle's longest run of the year came against San Antonio, an 86-yard carry. I guess for the Texans, the positive was Pringle didn't score a touchdown against them. Well, actually, he fumbled on that 86-yard run, but uh, Baltimore re uh, scored a touchdown. Culver recovered it in the end zone, but one of the things is an 86-yard run, that's what you don't want your defense to give up. At the 15, Pringle will try the right side, and this time has trouble with the footing. And his drop for a loss as Charles Franks moved up from his Mike safety Pringle position. And that's the end of the first quarter. You're in Baltimore, where the offense has moved the ball, but not much scoring. The CFL on CBC, brought to you by Ford of Canada. Makers of the new 1996 Ford Taurus. Ready to start the second quarter at Memorial Stadium. And already signs that the field is starting to break up. And there was concern about the turf here today, James. We saw it on the last run by Pringle. Well, when you have a soft field that's such as this, you really have to be sure of how you plant your feet. And Mike Pringle planted on his heels and he lost his footing. Second down, 13 to go. Ham has plenty of time, and it's almost picked off. Tommy Smith, who had a pick last week, had it go through his hands that time. And, and that's one of those opportunities that will come back to haunt you because you don't get many chances against this great Baltimore offense, and Tommy Smith should have had that one, and carrying it back the other way might still be running, but you're going to give work to another opportunity to put points on the scoreboard, and that could cost San Antonio later in the game. You see, Carlos Huerta has put down the tee. He does not normally use a tee, but because of the poor field conditions, he is going to use one in this spot, and it may be the worst spot on the field. And Huerta puts it through. So he remains perfect. Check that. He's missed one the long 47-yarder, two for three against San Antonio today. And Baltimore has just basically dominated the first quarter. Rushing, passing the ball, Tracy Ham with 90 yards. Everyone thinks about David Archer when you come into a game as far as a quarterback throwing the ball, but the total yards of 122 and the 90 yards of Tracy Ham passing the football. One point about the first quarter, second, the start of the second quarter here, you're going to have to mark that and remember that. Tommy Smith let one get away. That was a great opportunity for San Antonio, and he's going to have to think about that one as the game carries on. You know, we've talked about field conditions, weather conditions. Don Matthews, even though it was rainy and clement all week, had his team practice outside to get used to these conditions. Here's Saunders up the middle for a hard-fought three yards and no more. And, and, I, and I really respect that decision by Don Matthews to keep his team out in these type of conditions because you have to play on them. You can't gauge what your game day weather is going to be. So if you prepare the team for any type of weather, then they'll be better prepared as the week goes on mentally. And that's what you want, to have them in the game mentally and not worry about the weather conditions. San Antonio, a dome team, although they did practice outside this week. Certainly not in these conditions. A little Canadian chill in the air. Archer, problems with it. Loose ball. And who got back on it? Still loose. And the Stallions have it. O.J. Brigance. A big turnover for Baltimore. Great opportunity for Baltimore to get the turnover early in the game. When you're sitting in the shotgun, you have to make sure that the snap comes right back to the quarterback. David Archer started to pull out early. He has to wait on the snap to get there. The quarterback can't jump the gun. That time he cost his team a huge turnover. The only team with a better 
giveaway takeaway ratio this year the Edmonton Eskimos Baltimore number two and they have a big turnover here first down at the 21 pressure on him and they've got him Roosevelt Collins has the sack that's the third time already they've got to Tracy Ham this afternoon. Well, the defensive ends for San Antonio have done a wonderful job here in the first half. Roosevelt Collins and James Kings have put a lot of pressure from the outside. Collins came through that time untouched from the top of your screen. Tracy Ham could not elude him. San Antonio with the big sack once again defensively. So it's second down 23 after the sack. Back at the 34. Better protection. Ham. And that's almost picked off. This time, Charles Frank's got his hands on the ball. But the bounty hunters are not squeezing the pigskin. You, you talked about none of these guys being selected to the all-star team, any of the secondary members for San Antonio. And people talk about great defensive backs, but great defensive backs are normally poor offensive receivers, and that's why they play that side of the football. That ball was catchable once again in the hands of a San Antonio defender. San Antonio once again missed a great defensive opportunity. Now Huerta from 41 yards out. Dryer part of the field. And he puts it through. So the fumble on the bad snap to Archer cost them three more. And it's a 9-1 Stallion lead. San Diego and Buffalo, the head coach of Buffalo from 83 to 85, and his strength coach with the Buffalo Bills, the owner of the Stallions, Jim Spiro. Well, Jim looked like he could still play. And another interesting point when uh, K was a hit, the quarterback back in Buffalo, his teammate was Jack Kemp. His son is a, the backup quarterback for San Antonio, Jim Kemp. Catch for David Gamble out here, the first down at the 45-yard line. It may require a measurement on that first down play. All Canadian Irv Smith the tackle. And there's Jim Kemp, who got in last week to throw a touchdown pass to Mike Saunders when the game was out of reach against Birmingham. Well, that, that was a big plus also for him to get in the game and, and have some action to, to, to develop his confidence because you never know when you may lose your starting quarterback. Second and inches, and that's just about all they got. That will be enough. But I would think a critical early drive for San Antonio. They haven't got anything done offensively. A week ago, they scored on six of their first nine possessions and stormed to that 36-6 lead. But a lot of that was based off of great field positions from turnovers from the defense. The defense has let great opportunities get away this afternoon when they had an opportunity to come up with great defensive turnovers. It's first down at the 46 of San Antonio. And they swing it out left side, Saunders. Gets outside, but a flag down. And this one likely to come back as David Gamble was out in front blocking for Saunders. Well, David Gamble was actually out in front holding for Mike Saunders, but that's what you do when you have Mike Saunders is that you want to get the ball in his hand early, allow him to get those shoulders square and turn up field. So not much has gone right for Stevenson and the Texans so far in this first half. Well, that's a huge break for Baltimore because it seemed like San Antonio might be getting untracked offensively. Now they're marching them back with the, with the first and 20. This is where you want to gamble defensively and bring your blitz possible. Archer over center after the misfired shotgun snap. And guns it over the head of Joe Kralik, incomplete. We haven't heard from Kralik this afternoon, nor Mark Stock, and they were the favorite receivers this season. Well, they had the big games last week in San Antonio, each coming up with touchdown grabs, but that time you could see that David Archer was a bit antsy in the pocket. He has to be more poised and give his receivers time to finish their routes. Second and 20, and Archer has an extra receiver in. Kendrick Taylor as Heath Sherman's gone to the bench. Here comes the rush, and they outlet it to stop. His first catch 
gets San Antonio back to the original line of scrimmage, but it'll be third and ten as Irv Smith stops stop. And that was an excellent defensive series by Baltimore because when they got San Antonio forced back in a first and 20, they played deep zone coverage. They opened up underneath, not allowing them enough yardage to pick up the first down. Now they're forced to punt once again. Chris Wright with three returns last week, 70 yards against Winnipeg. And his biggest return was 50. Todd Jordan's kept the ball out of his hands for the most part so far. You got to keep it down the middle of the field, though. And Wright has trouble with that. And good coverage that time by San Antonio. As Wright had trouble nice with the wind and a 50-yard Todd Jordan punch. a champ, a member of the War Amps Child Amputee Program. He lost his arm in a farming accident. Recently, Merrill visited the Sky Dome to present the CFL with the PlaySafe Award. Thanks for the plaque, Merrill. The CFL is proud of the War Amps PlaySafe Program. Hey, Merrill, any advice for the kids watching at home today? Don't let it happen to you. Sport check Grey Cup Saturday from Regina next Saturday at 4 o'clock Eastern. Brian Williams will host as we set the scene for the big game on Sunday. Brian here in Baltimore for the game this afternoon as the Stallions and Texans try to establish the first entrant in the night in the 83rd Grey Cup game. Ringle and again the footing of factor is Mike Why may not have got back to the line of scrimmage. The footing is a problem in this area of the field, but the biggest problem right now that possesses San Antonio is that Lost they need to come up with a play, defensive stand. They cannot the allow runners. another long march by Baltimore. And the time of possession is going to be a telling stat in this first half because Baltimore has had some good drives to keep the ball out of Archer's hands. Second and ten, Ham pumped once, now on a roll, and he'll pull it down. Tracy Ham diving for what should be a first down. That's the second time today Ham's taken it upon himself to move the sticks. And both times when Tracy Ham took the opportunity to run, it's when they had an uneven pass rush. Tracy Ham saw that the pocket had collapsed all inside, bounced it outside, picked up once again a stallion first down. I love the way Kay Stevenson describes the defensive responsibilities there. You have to respect your lane integrity. And what he means by that, the same way you go upfield, you have to be able to retract yourself in the same line. And that's what the defense hasn't done here in the first half. There's the out to Armstrong who gets outside. Forced out at the San Antonio and bench. But that hitch pass to Armstrong will move the sticks again. And Ham likes to get it in this guy's hands. Well, what you do here is you have your slip screen. You got, you'll have a, your receiver out here, Armstrong, in, in the flat. He's a wide, he's the farthest guy out. And you come back, and the other receivers run off the defenders, and he gets the ball underneath, picks up the blocks, picks up another Baltimore first down. Tracy Ham is seven for ten in this first half, 103 yards so far. And Mike Pringle. Up the middle to the 47-yard line. Lance Teichelman has entered the game as a defensive tackle as we join Mark. Chris, this field is deteriorating as this game moves on already. And uh, just taking a look here outside the numbers, this is the only area that was not covered by a tarp overnight. They had rain and snow. You can see that sandy substance. It's kind of like a kitty litter, very absorbent. They've thrown that down to try to sop up some of the water. But I think I might have the most appropriate footwear here today. The old toe rubbers. He always does make a fashion statement. Next week, it'll be the hats at Taylor Field. 
Here's Robert Clark with a catch. And Clark has been pretty silent in this Baltimore attack in recent weeks. Just two touchdowns on the year, and both came against San Antonio early in the season. Well, I think he was disappointed after last week's game. He had an over. He did not make one catch, and as a receiver, that's a disappointing afternoon. But to be able to make a catch here in the first half, that will make your receivers round out more. They will get more involved in the offense. They'll run much more crisp routes when they go off the line of scrimmage. And he's had everybody into this now. Pringles caught a pass Alvin Clark Culver and Armstrong and they're in San Antonio territory here's Pringle off the left side and Mike Pringle has his best gain of the game down to the 42 it's another Baltimore first down and this is a key drive for Baltimore you said the Texans had to stop them and they haven't found a way yet well, the key is, is watch as Tui Peloto number 32 the fullback he'll come back and he'll lead Pringle on this play. It's basically a counter with the fullback and Dixon the guard, but Tui Peloto gets the key kickout block, allowing Pringle to pick up the 12 yards on the run. So a varied Baltimore offensive attack, and Armstrong went over the line of scrimmage, tried to pull back, but by then, play had been whistled down you know we talked about the strong san antonio passing game coming into this game but tracy ham has done such a fine job in spreading the wealth of passes amongst his receivers the running backs the wide receivers so you really haven't gotten a bead on an offensive pattern that tracy ham has developed and that's what has made this baltimore offense so strong here in the first half is the versatility of it first down and 15. Well, Don Matthews, Ham's biggest supporter. Tracy's telling us before the game that uh, this is as healthy as he has been at this time in the season in his career. And there's that time of possession stat. Ham's had it for five more minutes than Archer. And on first and 15, not much for Pringle on that carry. If he got back to the line of scrimmage. Bethune and Collins converge. Well, I, I can recall the days early in Tracy Ham's career, 89-90, when he was a 1,000-yard rusher in back-to-back -back seasons, when he was with the Edmonton Eskimos, and in 90, he led the Eskimos to the Grey Cup, no his first Grey Cup as a starter with Edmonton. But Tracy Ham's game right now is much stronger than what it was early in his career because he's a bona fide leader now. You know, when you consider Tracy's history, I think the most important thing he's done today is the way he's spread out the receivers. But he's in trouble here, and for the fourth time today, they've got to ham, and this might be the most distressing aspect of the first half for Don Matthews. They've been able to get to ham on occasion. That, that has to be the one concern for Don Matthews is James King and Roosevelt Collins from their defensive ends position have been able to force Tracy Ham inside. They've been able to collapse the pocket and the tackles have gotten to push up the middle and that's where the sacks have occurred when they have the equal pass rush coming on that flat plane. Make Maurice Miller, the middle linebacker, got the sack. Now Josh Miller with the putt and he sends it out of bounds and they'll mark it at the 16-yard line. So San Antonio down and pinned here late in the first half. Today's Southern Division Final at Memorial Stadium. Well, there's the result of a remarkable 24 hours weather-wise in Maryland. Uh, yesterday afternoon, it was about 67 degrees. By nighttime, it had fallen into the 30s. We had rain, we had snow, high winds, tornado. It apparently touched down... Uh, just outside Baltimore. Today, a gorgeous day, but uh, a muddy track. Kind of reminds you of your backyard. You're doing some home improvements back there. Yeah, it's about as sloppy. Lee Sherman pulled down. Nice play by Grant Carter, who's had a fine season at defensive end for Baltimore. Grant Carter, the defensive end out of the University of Pacific, reading the screen pass out in the flat and getting out there. He's the unsung hero of that defensive front. Peyton gets all the publicity, the sack master on the left side, but Grant Carter has been the steadying force. He's really allowed them to do some extra things, allowed them to move O.J. Brigantz this season into the middle linebacker position. 3.40 to go, first half, 9-1 Baltimore. Second and 10. Archer, good protection. And Stock can't hang on. 
Irv Smith in the neighborhood again, and David Archer, and the San Antonio offense is stuck in neutral. Well, it's almost be becoming a sense of urgency for this San Antonio offense. They have really struggled here in the first half. A big plus for them would be able to come out of this with decent defensive field position with a good punt from Jordan because right now Baltimore has been on a roll and you don't want to let them get in for a major before the half ends. So again, it's up to Jordan. From deep in his own zone, standing at the goal line. And Wright awaiting the punt in Texan territory. They kick away from Wright. And the ball bouncing down, they'll get the no yards. Texans think they have the football, but no yards, a penalty marker after just a 22-yard punt. The second four punt of the game for Jordan. He hit a knuckler that time into a pretty stiff breeze, and the ball didn't carry it all. He caught his own teammates in that no-yard zone, and it's going to cost him a lot of field position. Baltimore already is in field goal range for Wurton. Now Jordan had a 60-yarder for a single. He's had a 39-yarder, a 21-yarder, a 22-yarder, and a 50-yarder. So it has been a real mixed bag for the Texan punter so far today. Well, in the CFL, the special teams are very important to the success of your ball club. And San Antonio has been losing that battle here in the first half. And Baltimore has been playing on a shorter and shorter field after every Jordan kick. See if the Stallions have a killer instinct on offense. They swing it out to Tui Pelotu. And a nice tackle out there by Jason Wallace. Who has been one of the most consistent DVs for the Texans this year. The three-minute warning given to the benches here first half. We're back in Baltimore. Chris Cuthbert, James Curry, Mark Lee, and the CFL on CBC crew. Well, these were the keys for the te Texans to hit the Regina. How are they doing? Well, uh, they've done one thing well, is that they've contained Tracy Ham in the pocket. They haven't been able to establish a ground game, but the special teams have really hurt him here in the first half. And David Archer hasn't been hot. Tracy Ham facing second and three. From the 25 of San Antonio, Pringle. And he stops just beyond the line of scrimmage. And it'll be third down. And the fans urging Don Matthews to gamble. Well, it's an interesting dilemma for Don Matthews right here. But if I'm Don Matthews, I'm going for it. I got an offensive line that averages about 315 pounds across the board. I feel that they should win any war that they're in, and if it's only a yard or less, they should get it. Mike Pringle should get the ball. For all your party Brothers. Foot short, maybe two. And Don Matthews has left the offense out there. Well, right there is going to be the key. Willie Fierce, he is going to be the guy who is going to have to make the play up front. As you see, as they come up the middle, he holds his own, stops him short of the first down. Pringle to Ipolutu. And will it be him? And him pushing off, flag down. If him didn't get it, the penalty marker against San Antonio will likely decide it. Roosevelt Collins, 56, the defensive lineman. Roosevelt Collins got in that neutral zone, and it cost him. He's right down here at the bottom of your screen, and he'll get in that neutral zone. Automatic first down, Baltimore. So the gamble pays off. But when you look at the field con conditions, it becomes more of a gamble today. You're not getting the great push that you would on a normal track. Well, if you don't get the great push, just lean behind Neil Ford at about 360 pounds. He'll provide a way for you. Ham sets up and now just gets rid of the football, and he was belted as he released it. 
closest man to it was Armstrong, but Ham was just getting rid of it. Tracy has taken hits this afternoon, but he has not gambled, and that is the key. He hasn't thrown the ball in bad position. Although San Antonio let a couple get through their hands, he has stayed in the pocket. He has taken the hits, but he's given his receivers the time to run their routes. No huddle for Ham. Just over two minutes to play. And second and ten, Baltimore. Four receivers left side. Here comes the rush. And Ham has to keep it himself, but he won't get the first down. Finally bounced out of bounds by Bobby Humphrey. And George Bethune was on his tail the entire way. Well, George Bethune has been the big man. He had eight sacks coming into this game for the San Antonio, Texas, but that time, great pursuit, but the coverage was good in the back end. Everyone kept their man. They played man-to-man -man defense, not allowing Tracy to find an open receiver. Now, work to end for his fifth attempt in the first half. Minute 58 to go, first half, and again, Carlos Huerta, 22 yards up this time. Chips this one through. So the offense has been handled by Horta. And Baltimore expands its lead. Canadian Tire has great prices on everything you need. Plus, earn Canadian Tire money with every cash purchase of merchandise. Great prices made better at Canadian Tire. Carlos Huerta, four for five so far. 50 field goals during the regular season, just too shy of Dave Ridgway's CFL record for a single year. He did. He had an outstanding regular season coming over from the Las Vegas Posse. He was the one guy to sure up that kicking game they felt. He's got a fine job. David Archer is hit hard. O.J. Brigance got to Archer. After he was flushed out of the pocket, and the Baltimore defense has been the story of this first half. Well, one of the things that's always been a hindrance for David Archer is his lack of mobility. He could not elude O.J. Brigance as he came up and made a great open field tackle. O.J. last year played the rush in position for Baltimore, then moved into the middle linebacker position this year with the growth of Grant Carter, who took over that rush position. But great mobility from the linebacker from Rice University minute and a half to go first half and the Texans trying to get something done on offense they swing it out to Saunders and Mike Saunders spun down at the 38 as a gain of 10 but they are seven short Matt Goodwin the tackle and Archer and the Texans have to go back to the sideline now I have to question David Archer's play selection that's the play that you want to run on first down not trying to roll out because you're immobile and try to throw deep but throw the ball to Mike Saunders he's a great asset to have in your backfield and he hasn't utilized him properly here in the first half the team that scored 38 first half points last week on route to a 52-9 victory has been shut down on the muddy track at Memorial Stadium and Jordan kicking to right Right on the dead run, and he plunges to the 50-yard line of Baltimore. A 32-yard punt, a 10-yard return as we join Mark. All right, Chris, they're warming up in snowbound Calgary for the other half of our playoff experience today. It's the North Division final. The Stampeders playing host to Larry Ruck and the Edmonton Eskimos. Remember, 94, Doug Flutie, too cold to continue. The Eskimos beating the Stamps to go to the Cup. Well, it's... Calgary and Edmonton all over again. Larry Ruck has that win deeply entrenched in his mind. Chris looks downright balmy there. Cold here, too. Here's Ham out to Pringle. The swing pass. And Mike Pringle shakes off a tackle and gets over midfield. 43 seconds to play. <laughs> Mike Pringle eating some dirt to get a big gainer and trying to get Baltimore back into scoring position. He just wants to get a hose or get to the locker room to clean up. Yeah, you call that a mud <laughs> pie. It's a mud eye, yeah, I guess you would say, was the best thing you could say about that. He even got it in the mouthpiece. Yeah, don't use the mouthpiece, Mike. <laughs> 
Well, Mike has 75 yards of offense so far today. He'll take it again. Left side breaks it. Mike Pringle. A heck of a mutter. Charles Frank probably finally forced him out. San Antonio by not wiping off his face thinking that he might not be able to see but watch the great hole on the left side of this offensive formation Chris even you could have ran through that but Mike Pringle made the initial move got out in the open once again a great game for this great back of the Baltimore State I always wanted to play in the mud like that I just want to see you in a uniform Pringle again trying to find a seam then there was nothing doing that time. Finished off by Maurice Miller. An all-star linebacker a year ago. Maurice Miller, you see him right in the middle of your screen. And this is classic middle linebacker. Scraping down, fighting off blockers, feeling where the running back is. Come up, wrapping up, and drop him in his tracks. 14 seconds left in this first half. 12-1. Baltimore facing a second down and 13 as Pringle gets the towel down. Yeah, he'll be looking for an early shower when he goes in at halftime and stop trying to get some of that mud out of his face, but he's had an outstanding first half. We always talk about his running ability, but I think the big difference with Mike Pringle here in the first half has been his pass catching out of the backfield. He has really kept his San Antonio defense off balance this, this afternoon. Put the helmet back on, and the mud started dripping back down, but we got the squeeze. Not a problem for Pringle. He's been a problem for San Antonio, and he has it again on second and long. And he's drilled at the 30 as the Texans limit his gain. And on third down, they'll call for Carlos Huerta. Seven seconds to play, and Huerta looking for his fifth field goal of this first half. Well, if you're a San Antonio defender, you have to feel very pleased with your performance in the first half. Defensively, they've done a, a good job at keeping Baltimore off the board with any major touchdowns in the first half. And he has that tee turned upside down. Actually, he's going to flip it over right here. But they've done a good... No, he's going to keep it face down. So this is interesting. This is an attempt from 37 yards out. A drier part of the field where Huerta is standing. Crowley puts it down. Carlos Huerta has had a big rebound day for Baltimore on the final play of the first half. He makes it a 15-1 stallion lead, so it's a pair of touchdowns. A big deficit for Kay Stevenson's team on a muddy track in Baltimore. Well, you talk about just a pair of touchdowns, but the, the size of that deficit when San Antonio's offense hasn't been able to get anything on track here in the first half. Let's go down to Mark. All right, we're on the sidelines with Don Matthews. Don, no touchdowns yet, but five field goals. You've got field position locked up, and you've kept Archer uh, a bit rattled. How do you see the first half? Well, this uh, field is really affecting the play. About the 25 to 30-yard line in, it's very, very soft, and it's hard to have good offensive football, and our drives are stalling because of that. But we've had the wind in the second quarter, and we're going to be able to get it again in the fourth quarter. So I think it's going to be a, a deciding factor maybe later in the game. Looks like your practice all week on the natural turf. The kicking game is paying dividends for you here today. Yeah, it really has. You know, Carlos is a good kicker, but uh, outside the 35-yard line, it feels in good shape. It's just inside that it's tough. All right, Don, thanks for your time. Good luck in the second half. Don Matthews and his stallions in complete control at the half. Chrysler Canada's halftime report. Now, here is your host, Scott Oak. In Baltimore, the CFL is still the focus. San Antonio Texans and Stallions are through 30 minutes of the South Final with Baltimore leading 15 to 1 and 5. Huerta field goals. The record for field goals in a CFL playoff game is six. We'll give odds on Huerta at least tying that and probably breaking it. Kent, uh, we thought this game was going to be both high scoring and close and uh, 
I've been wrong on both counts. Yeah, we're over two. Uh, Baltimore had an opportunity to score more points than they than they got in the first half. However, San Antonio had opportunities to take three field goals away from Baltimore with three missed opportunities on interceptions. Yeah, it's 15-1 Baltimore. Could just as easily be one nothing San Antonio if the Texans could have held on to three obvious interceptions. Yeah, or at least at least six to one. Here's here's the first uh, uh, play of, of the game for Baltimore's offense. A clear opportunity for the safety to make a pick there. Here's the next play going down on the goal line where Tracy just really forced it into coverage and the linebacker didn't hold on. And then I think we're going to see the safety again had an opportunity to snuff out a third drive by Baltimore here with a possible interception and dropped again. That gave Baltimore a chance for nine points. Now Charles Franks, Tommy Smith, and Charles Franks with the San Antonio drops in that order. Uh, Kent, uh, Kay Stevenson spent much of yesterday arguing that his team should be heavy underdogs in the South Final. And the Texans have gone up and proven this point <laughs> in the first half. Well, I'm really surprised that San Antonio hasn't played better than they have offensively, although I did give Baltimore the edge going into this game because of their defense. They're certainly not playing, San Antonio's not playing the same defense that they did last week. But an hour and a half away from kickoff here in Calgary between the Eskimos and Stampeders, you think the Eskimos' best chance of winning the North Final is if it's low scoring. Absolutely. If it's a high scoring game that plays into Calgary's uh, hands, I believe that Edmonton has to force turnovers on defense to have a chance to beat Calgary. Eskimo defense is led by Willie Pless. In fact, he leads the team in career playoff defensive tackles. Had six last week in the semifinal win over BC and uh, the Eskimos will need another big day from him. Doug Flutie, the Stamps would have us believe, isn't the shoe in to start today, but he wants to start and start quickly to erase the memories of a tough first quarter last week and Flutie spoke to Don Whitman. Doug Flutie, four interceptions in the first half against Hamilton. Were they doing things differently? Yeah, they were. They uh, did some things to try to take away our slots and try to force me to go up over the top with the ball and throw the ball to the wideouts. Uh, the thing was, uh, there were just some different looks. We hadn't played Hamilton, and, and they gave me some looks that I wasn't accustomed to seeing. The booing at halftime when you left the field, did that bother you? I'd say, yeah, it bothered me a little bit. I mean, you're not human if you don't let uh, that bother you because, you know, you bust your tail for four or five years, whatever it is, and you have one bad half, and it seems like people forget in a hurry. Good luck this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Now let's go over to Dan Kemp. Thank you very much. I'm here with linebacker Willie Pless of the Edmonton Eskimos. And, uh, Willie, this is the kind of day in the game that you've been playing all season to get to. Well, it's particularly nice to be in this game. Uh, last year we got knocked out early, uh, but it's, it's really nice to be in this situation again, and it should be a good and exciting game for us. A lot of pressure on the Edmonton Eskimos defense at Calgary. As I look at the depth chart, there's a lot of weapons on there. Receivers, Tony Stewart, and a guy named Doug Flutie. Well, anytime you have that many weapons, uh, it's always going to be a challenge for us, but uh, particularly we're going to have to shut down Tony Stewart, the, the running game, and of course, you know, Doug, uh, whoever's the quarterback is going to be, he's going to try to take the game into his own hands. Uh, so it's going to be a challenge for us defensively overall. Once this game gets going, does, does weather play a factor in it at all? I don't think so. Many people say uh, the weather might have a factor, but uh, we've been in this situation before, and so have uh, Calgary. Uh, we'll be ready to play, and I'm sure they will too. Willie, uh, good luck today and congratulations on a great season. Yeah, thank you very much. Back to you, Scott. So it's the Eskimos and Stamps and what's become a standing engagement to battle for the division championship. That's later when uh, the Chrysler Canada halftime continues, though, we'll return to Baltimore. Back to Memorial Stadium in the Chrysler Canada halftime report. The hometown Stallions in front of the Texans 15 to 1. It's been all kicking all the time. All the points coming from the feet of the kickers. We heard Don Matthews say that the muddy field ground his offense to a halt several times, but clearly the Stallions have won the field position game. Yeah, and I think really one of the key mistakes early in the game was Kenny Wilhite. Instead of conceding a single point, he brought it out uh, to around the 10-yard line. It seemed to back up San Antonio early, and they've been on a hole ever since. Well, only in the CFL can special teams dominate a game, and Chris Wright, the best special team player possibly in the CFL, has really forced San Antonio into some bad field positions, especially the shank punt. Early in the game from Jordan, Jordan had a great opportunity to get uh, San Antonio out of poor field position, but he shanked it out and gave Baltimore great field position. Yeah, and I know Cal Murphy said last week that Josh Miller might be as valuable to Baltimore as Mike Pringle, but here's Jordan having trouble, and this was another reason they were backed up early. Well, that, that's one of the things. When you have a great return guy who has always been instant field position for the regular season, and when you get a chance, you have to keep the ball away from him. But the sacks on... David Archer early in the game. O.J. Brigance did a great job in keeping him contained in the pocket. Archer is not that mobile, and it cost San Antonio once again poor field position. And uh, this is the kind of track where a guy <laughs> can get down and dirty, and that's what Mike Pringle did in the first half. Well, Mike Pringle has been a mutter this afternoon. He has been able to hit the holes open. Even with the mud in his face, he's been able to find those gaping holes up front. 
give his team great field position, and that's what has kept Baltimore in the lead, is controlling field position this afternoon. Now, if Pringle can't go in the mud, they've got to go to the passing game, and one thing we've noticed also is that Ham has been sacked four times in the first half. Well, he's been sacked, but great defensive presence by San Antonio that has kept them in the game, even though they're down by 14 points. I walked by the San Antonio locker room on the way up to the press box, and there was a lot of shutting. We'll see how they adjust in the second half. We've got the kickoff coming right up when we come back to the Horseshoe at Memorial Stadium. Well, they tell us the football fans of Saskatchewan have a great cup planned like no other coming up in one week's time. It all begins with our coverage Saturday, the colorful great cup parade. Wait till you see that folding chair marching band out of Saskatoon. And then we've got the 83rd great cup from Regina beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern with our countdown. Can't wait to see that one. We'll see the first half of the equation and that one answered here as we get set for the second half. And they're all ready to go with the kickoff. And here's Chris and James. And it's always a joy to go back to Regina. I think everybody in Canada is looking forward to the festivities in Regina next week, and it's going to be one heck of a party. These two teams are looking forward to it, but only one's going. Barring overtime, 30 minutes away from a trip to Taylor Field as Huerta kicks it off. And Will Height had a little trouble picking it up. Gets it over the 40. And the... San Antonio Texans will go back to work on offense, trying to improve on these statistics from the first half. Well, they're really going to have to work on their passing game. You know, coming into this game over the last 10 games, David Archer passed with well over 3,100 yards, and that's been a sore spot. He hasn't been able to get any offensive productivity this afternoon, so right now it's very crucial that he can march his team down the field. This team had 445 yards offense against Birmingham last week. Not even a hundred in that first half. There's Mark Stock. And Stock cracked as he got across the 45 at the 48. O.J. Brigantz with the tackle. Well, Mark Stock, probably the speediest of all receivers, trips to the bottom of the screen. He is the guy who gets the other receivers to run it off. He comes back, gets a separation. But the offensive line getting out in front, but the great pursuit by this Baltimore defense is very hard to fool this team sideline to sideline, so you have to hit them with quick hitters that go straight up the middle. Stock has three consecutive 100-yard games. He got six on that game. Second and four, and they do go to the ground this time, and not much there. It closed right up at the line of scrimmage. And Mike Saunders stopped well short of the first. Well, this Baltimore defense has had an excellent first half, and they started the second half just like they finished. The leading tackler on this defense is Tracy Gravely throughout the regular season. Doesn't mind putting his nose right up in that hole and stopping Mike Saunders before he can get on track. And on third down, it's again Todd Jordan kicking to Chris Wright. And Tony Burse, who wears 28 for San Antonio, their leading specialty team man, will be after Wright. As Jordan with the wind at his back, not a great kick. Let's see what Wright does with it. He gets outside. And out of bounds at the San Antonio bench. Chris Wright on the right. Flag down back at the original line of scrimmage in the preliminary indication against San Antonio. So the right return should stand. A 35-yard punt, a 22-yard return, and... Texans have to do better than that, James, with the wind at their back. Well, well, Chris Wright played a huge part in the first half, even when he didn't touch the football. And you can see how dangerous he is once he gets his hands on the ball. He's instant field position. Baltimore operated for the most part on a short field. And as you see Goodwin come around, around the corner, he almost lays out and gets this one, but it put a lot of pressure on Jordan, the punter. Matt Goodwin had two blocks on the year, six for the Stallions and all to lead the CFL. First down, Ham pulls it back down, trying to get outside, and Tracy Ham scampers and is knocked out at the Baltimore bench. Jason Wallace moved up. Ham dropped the football, but it bounced out of bounds and is maintained by the Stallions. Well, Trace, go ahead on. Tracy Ham once again, he couldn't find an open receiver, but he didn't take a chance in trying to force it in to someone who was covered down the field. 
Five-yard pickup for Tracy. And it'll be second and five. Again, as you heard Don Matthews, the field chewed up at either end, but in this middle portion, it's in pretty good shape. A lot of steamboats, and now Ham is flushed out. And he takes off again. First down, Tracy Ham. And that was vintage Ham against the Texan defense that time. Well, you say vintage Tracy Ham. Uh, you can even say classic Tracy Ham. Tracy Ham is in complete control of this football game as a passer and a runner. He really has this San Antonio defense off balances at this point. He came with the pump fake. Pulled it down, picked up once again another Baltimore first down. In the two previous meetings against San Antonio, 156 yards total rushing and 154. Ham has 53 on his own so far. Gives to his running mate, Pringle, straight up the middle, pounding it down to the 32. It's another Baltimore first down. Tom Gerhardt, the tackle. Watch right up the middle as this offensive line, Subis, with the call, poor Donish. I mean, you can drive a bus through that hole. They've done a fine job of exploding off the line, moving this San Antonio defense backwards, and Mike Pringle has picked up 79 yards. A typical Mike Pringle day on his way towards 100. So Baltimore driving first down. And a time count violation is going to push it back five. Well, that's one of the few mistakes that Tracy Ham has made this afternoon, costing his team five yards on the time count violation. But San Antonio had done something defensively that he did not like, so he took the five yards instead of costing himself a possible turnover. Give to Pringle, he'll try the left side, and Pringle caught from behind. Big Maurice Miller, the middle linebacker, with the tackle and a gain of just three for Pringle that time. Maurice Miller's done an excellent job inside out this afternoon from the back linebacker position. He's a big, agile man, about 6'4", 235, but he plays this inside out as Pringle makes the move, he makes the tackle. Make it second and 11 for Baltimore. And Ham dumps it off. There's Pringle with the catch. And he is dropped by Gerhardt. Miller hanging on at the 29. And they'll be well short of the first down. It'll be Carlos Huerta time. As Huerta, Subas is shaken up. You know, you, you'll talk about that being short of the first down. But you have to appreciate Mike Pringle right here and what he does after he catches the ball. He knows where the goalposts are, and he comes right back to the middle of the field, and that's where Tracy Ham throws the ball. He stays right in the middle to line it up perfectly for Huerta. From the 36-yard line, Carlos Huerta to tie a CFL playoff record, puts it up, and puts it through. Six field goals for number six. And it's 18 to 1 for the Stallion. Sean Fleming had six last week as Edmonton ousted the defending Grey Cup champions. No T that time. Same result. Carlos Huerta has been over 80% efficient the last two years as a field goal kicker in the CFL. And today, six for seven to tie a CFL record. And to put his stallions in front by 17 points. Three seconds shy of five minutes gone in this third quarter at Memorial Stadium. And Huerta kicks it to Kenny Wilhite. And Wilhite up to the 35-yard line. The safety Chris Johnson with the tackle to limit the return to 16 yards. And, you know, we spoke about how important the kicking game is, but the mechanics of it. It comes with the spot of the football, but what's most important is the spin. Watch Crowley as he turns the laces away from his kicker's foot, allowing him to hit the sweet spot on the football. Perfect field goal was the result. Crowley from Towson State, which is just 
up the road from Memorial Stadium here in Baltimore. First down, Archer. Back out to Stock in the outside. And Mark Stock drilled at the 39. That's a gain of five, but Gravely and Brigance converging on the slot back. And a critical drive now for David Archer. Those are very un-Archer-like numbers. They are, but David Archer is facing a defense that is possessed with a lot of speed. And when you have to go from sideline to sideline, you play into Baltimore's hands. He hasn't yet, to this afternoon, taken advantage of the middle of the field. Second and five, and Archer dropped the snap from center. Baltimore's got it. Second time today. The shotgun snap's got a rye. And a turnover. Gerald Bayless isn't going to let that pigskin go. Former Saskatchewan Rough Rider makes another big play to get Baltimore closer to a trip to Regina. And once again, you have to blame that on quarterback David Archer. You have to stay in there and wait on the football. David Archer is right here. He will pull out prior to the ball arriving to him. He is looking downfield. You have to concentrate and look the football into your hands. Second time this afternoon, he's laid it on the turf here at Memorial Stadium. Well, it's a breakdown like that that you just couldn't foresee from a guy of Archer's status. Here's a little swing pass to Alpin. And Gerald Alpin stopped by Bobby Humphrey. <laughs> And that's Gerald's first reception of the afternoon, I do believe. Made his second reception. But Gerald Alfin is a fine compliment to Chris Armstrong at the slot position. You mentioned both of those receivers had the 18 touchdown receptions apiece last season. He has yet to round into that form here with Baltimore, but he is that consistent threat on the other side of the football field. Eight-year veteran, 49 touchdowns, and a fine CFL career. Tracy Ham. Pulling it down again. Lunging to the 25. Gain of six. And very close to the Tracy first down. Ham on the carry. Tackled by and when you talk about a fine CFL career, Tracy Ham has had just that. He has also had a fine afternoon. He has yet to put a major touchdown on the scoreboard this afternoon, but he has done the most critical thing. He has kept the ball out of David Archer's hands. He has kept him on the sideline. He has kept him cold. You'll see right at the end of this run, a possible face mask with Tracy Ham had something to complain about right there, but it was close and it was shielded from the officials. But Tracy Ham has kept his offense on the field for the most part this afternoon. And this is what he has done all season long. He has not put up big numbers. In fact, last week was his first 200-yard passing game in the last five. He only has one 300-yard game all year but he has run a good ball control offense to a 15 and three record, 11 consecutive wins, and Ham on a roll again. Tracy keeps it, and diving across the 15 yard line. That's another first down. Hurley Brown the tackle, but Ham's doing the job. Well, when Tracy Ham came into the CFL, one of the things here, you have to seal off this part. The offensive linemen are going to get out and seal that, allowing Tracy Ham to come around the corner. And that is the key. When you can get your offensive lineman, Sean Pardonis, last year's most outstanding offensive lineman in the CFL, led the way for Tracy Ham. This is where his reputation came from. When he came out of college in Georgia Southern, he was known as a runner. He developed his passing game, but his running game has always been one of his major tools. Here's the toss to Culver, but that didn't fool San Antonio. And again, it gets a lot tougher down in the Santa ends Culver where the turf is chewed up. Balance. And Culver dropped for a loss of a couple. This is the area on the field where you have to play straight ahead That's football. You can't try to be too tricky down here. Just have to play smash mouth power football. At 18 to 1, I think it's a given San Antonio has to stop Baltimore, but we're getting to the stage of the game, 6.15 to go, where they almost need to turn the ball over now. Here comes the blitz. Ham in trouble. And he falls forward to the 20, and that is behind the line of scrimmage, forcing third down. And Worker on the field once again, going to attempt his 
go after his seventh field goal this afternoon. He's had seven attempts, six successful. If he makes this, it will be a playoff record. Seven field goals in one CFL playoff game. Ron Matthews defended his kicker last week when he went two for five. As Mark Lee mentioned, they really worked on the kicking game in bad conditions this week. Huerta has adapted to a tee for the first time in his career. And he has a record now, his seventh straight field goal, and it's now a 21-1 lead. Stevenson's team in trouble in Baltimore. Carlos Huerta, one of the minor adjustments that Baltimore made to improve their football team this year. Replacing the very popular Donald Iquibique in Baltimore, and he has set a CFL playoff record today with seven field goals against San Antonio on the year. He is 16 of 17. Well, he was a minor adjustment. He was last year's Western Conference Outstanding Rookie nominee, so they knew what they were getting when they drafted him in that expansion draft. Archer throwing it, and Billy Hess does a nice job of reeling that in. San Antonio couldn't afford a drop now, and Hess does a nice job. Well, well, that's one of the things that I've been critical of David Archer on, is that his inability to throw underneath over the middle. This time, he gets Hess on a simple crossing route, but this is where David Archer can be effective, throwing the ball underneath over the middle. When you're throwing outs, they have so much speed that they can close on those passes. He, you play in the Baltimore's hands. 15-yard gain, the longest gain of the day for San Antonio. Archer, under pressure, gets it out to Saunders. And they rule incomplete. Well, I don't know, the official behind Saunders makes the call. There was an official facing Saunders that said it was a catch. And that one's hard to figure. Well, I, I'm kind of agreeing with Mike Saunders. Also, although the officials don't have the benefit of instant replay, we'll get a great look right here as Mike Saunders goes down and catches this football. He cradles it as it gets to the ground. Looks like he gets both hands under the football, but the official from behind the play made the call. The official that had a clear sight never waved it off. So it's second and ten in that shotgun snap in an adventure. And this one almost picked off by Earl Smith, intended for Joe Kralik. And did Kralik get popped as Smith juggled the football? Well, once again, David Archer wants to live vicariously throwing the ball to the sideline. The middle of the field is wide open, but yet he wants to continue, continuously challenge these corners of Baltimore. Earl Smith last year, Eastern Division All-Star, All-Canadian that time with great position breaking up that pass should have been an interception under four and a half minutes to go third quarter and baltimore in control at 21 to 1. todd jordan with the win better kick away from right and into the end zone and right would be wise to give up the point and he does no use playing around with a big lead. 63-yard single makes it 21-2. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Just a reminder, we are one week from Grey Cup Sunday. It all begins on the weekend. It's Saturday. We've got the Sport Check Grey Cup Parade, and then that is followed with our first of two countdown programs. The Sport Check Countdown on Saturday and Sunday, setting the table for the 83rd Grey Cup game in Virginia. Chris? And it's looking very much like a return trip for Baltimore. Here's Tracy Ham looking for Shannon Culver, but falling harmlessly out of bounds at the Baltimore bench. Pressure from Roosevelt Collins. But it was a very handsy play by Tracy Ham, not putting himself in jeopardy, throwing that ball out of bounds at least giving him an opportunity for a second and ten on the play and now it's the point in the game is there any gas left in the tank for this san antonio defense they came with the big four turnovers last week versus, versus birmingham but yet this afternoon they have not been able to foil what tracy ham has done offensively here comes the rush and ham underneath Drummond can't hang on 
And Baltimore will have to kick it with 3.24 to go, third quarter. Robert Drummond is a very dangerous receiver out of the backfield. This ball was actually behind him because he was open on the crossing route. Tracy Ham misgaged the speed of his receiver because if he had caught that, he had a lot of running room in that open field. Josh Miller hasn't been busy today. He's punting to Kenny Wilhite. And the left footer into the wind on a deep kick. Bouncing around there, and they'll get Baltimore for no yards at the 47, and they'll mark it up five. 30-yard punt by Miller. You know, you look at San Antonio coming back on the field. They scored the 52 points at home last week versus Birmingham. And that's one of the things, when you score a lot of points, you can't package them up. You can't package them up and bring them into the next, next week. David Archer passed for 309 yards last week. Only 84 thus far in this game. Three touchdowns, and he's yet to even get close to the end zone this afternoon. The lowest total for San Antonio passing this year, 137 yards at Taylor Field in Regina. That was a game, though, that Archer only played a bit of because of a hamstring problem. That's out in the flat, and Kralik has it across midfield. Well, Joe Kralik was the receiver in the San Antonio offense the first half of the year. He had 13 catches for 200 yards in one game against the Edmonton Eskimos. And in his first game against Baltimore, five for 140, separated his shoulder at midseason, and then a guy like Mark Stock took over as the number one receiver. They need all hands on deck now to get back in this one. Over the middle, Saunders, first down. Mike Saunders with a big gain. That's the biggest offensive play for the Texans today. Out of bounds at the 35, Irv Smith forcing Saunders out as the Texans look for a spark. And, and that's one of the things I've been preaching. Over the middle, go over the middle. This time Mike Saunders in the circle route. It's right over the middle, right in the open spot of that zone. Defense picks up excellent yardage down the sideline to the 35. Already San Antonio forced into a fire offense. Here comes the pressure. They dump it off and Archer missed Saunders open over the middle again as the outlet man well it's generally the safe spot in any defense because it's a it's a straight line the ball has to carry the lesser distance in that area when you're trying to throw those wide outs you allow the defense time to recover when you throw right over the middle the defense doesn't have time to react before the ball gets there your receiver can get his shoulders turned and start running billy hess found the end zone last week San Antonio had seven touchdowns last week, looking for their first today. Archer for Hess, stretched out, couldn't bring it in with Ken Watson covering. And now it's third down, and Roman Anderson will come on. Well, I think Hess might have had a complaint. Watches the ball arrive, he's going to get a shove in the back prior to making that reception so he might have had a, a, a right there with the officials but once again david archer going away from the things that he can have success with and wanting to gamble believing in his arm strength roman anderson four for four against baltimore this season his first attempt of the day from 43 out and the all-time leading scorer in ncaa history Puts three on the board to make it 21 to five, a minute 20 to go, third quarter. But the Texans have a long way to go. Well, you know, they really have a long way to go and field goals are not gonna win this game, even though Worcester has kicked seven for Baltimore this afternoon. And when you've been struggling offensively, you need to pick up a major to pick up some motivation. They've kept their defense on the field a long time this afternoon and David Archer hasn't been able to find a hot hand. Jay Stevenson and his offense had the wind advantage in this third quarter, but just four points to show for it so far. Looking for a big defensive stand here. Mike Pringle, big hole, and crunched 
as he got to the 42, Hurley Brown knocked Pringle flat. Well, I don't know who knocked flat, but Hurley brought the hammer, and he got a tack driven in his chest on that play. But watch Hurley Brown. He'll come from the left side of your screen as Pringle hits this hole, and he just explodes. But watch the contact. That's football, ladies and gentlemen. That's bringing the hammer right there. Hurley Brown, a former All-American out of Miami. Strong safety, now a linebacker. Pringle second down, and he is stopped. Looks like a yard short of the first down by Oscar Giles. One of the backup defensive linemen. That's why his jersey's clean, but he knocked Pringle into the mud short of the first down. Well, Oscar Giles is one of those defensive linemen that always has that motor running. He's always ticking. They say he's very boisterous. At that time, you can see him come across, handle his assignment. He, he knew he had nothing on the outside, so he just lined down the line of scrimmage. He made the stop short. And James, interesting. It's third and one. Don Matthews not going to gamble here. I don't know. Watch for the fake. You got two fullbacks in your up back position. Tui Peloto and Drummond. Great ball handles. They do go back to Miller. Had a little trouble with it. Will Height, 26 yard line. Lost his footing. Charles Anthony pins him. 40 yard punt. Two yards on the return as Will Height leaves a divot on the final play of the third quarter with the Stallions up on top. And 50,000 plus will jam Regina for the Grey Cup. Don't miss Sport Check Countdown to kickoff next Sunday. stop playing even though the Colts moved to Indianapolis they may be the Baltimore Browns band soon 30,217 have come out today on what might be the final game in CFL history in Baltimore but we're not sure yet Jim well, you, have, you have to hope that that doesn't occur and Jim Spurls as you said is going to do everything that he can to keep the Stallions here at home there's a swing pass to Heath Sherman who's been quiet today and Sherman gets across the 35 and has a pickup of close to nine. Tracy Gravely in on the tackle. And look at the time of possession. That sums up the game if the net yards don't. And I think the time of possession, you should put a little exclamation point and put Tracy Ham right underneath that because he has controlled the football for three quarters this afternoon. You know, the rushing total surprises me. San Antonio, the third best rushing team in the league during the regular season. They get the first down on the ground this time, but there has been much there today. It, it really has it. You have to give credit to Demetrius Maxey and Gerald Bayless, the two defensive tackles for Baltimore. They have done a fine job in the middle of that Baltimore defense working against this huge and improved San Antonio offensive line. But Gerald Bayless, former MVP, Demetrius Maxey only started seven games for Baltimore this year but he has been a dominant defensive force in the middle. First down, Archer working against the wind now over the middle and a drop by Saunders. Mike, usually a reliable receiver. Grant Carter was forcing Archer to hurry the throw. Well, he had 47 receptions out of the backfield in the regular season. He picked up two last week versus Birmingham, but once again, the Cardinal sin of a receiver trying to run prior to making the reception. Saunders hoping for a trip back to Regina where he played so well for the Rough Riders. Second and ten. Archer pressure on and he's down. Alfred Payton, number two in sacks on the season, does the sack dance after getting to Archer. Swag. Alfred Payton, you're going to find him at the top of your screen right up here. He's going to come off the corner. 18 sacks in the regular season, two last week versus Winnipeg, and one this afternoon versus Archer. The swag attack dance. What did you call yours? <laughs> hey, I was just happy to get back to the sideline and get a drink of water. I didn't have time to dance. 
bad kick by Jordan off the side of his foot. And Chris Wright's dancing now because he's gotten to the San Antonio punter today. Baltimore, where the Stallion fans are celebrating. 21-5 lead, 12.50 to go. Here in the fourth quarter, and after an 18-yard punt by Todd Jordan, Don Matthews' team in great shape. You know, their last loss was August 12th here in Baltimore against Memphis, and after the game, Don Matthews said there's no reason to lose again this year. Well, he has his team on track thus far, and they don't seem like they're in a losing mode right now with 21 points here on the scoreboard in the fourth quarter. First down at the San Antonio 48. And they give inside to Drummond. Big fullback out of Syracuse pounds it down to the 42. Gain of six. Robert German and Heath Sherman were teammates together with the Philadelphia Eagles. Heath Sherman now with San Antonio. Drummond with Baltimore. You know, we've mentioned that no team that's won 15 games has ever won the Grey Cup. Baltimore, Calgary, trying to change that. Armstrong let it go through his hands on Hands second and four, and it's third down. And you cannot fault Tracy Ham for that drop football on that play. That was a perfect strike from the Baltimore quarterback, as you'll see Armstrong. He's inside of the three receivers, the perfect slant over the middle. The ball reflected, deflected off of his shoulder pads. Tracy Ham has all the reason to be upset with his receiver on that play. So third down, and cue Carlos Huerta. This from 49 yards out. Well within his range. Misses this one, and again, Will Height will run it out. And Will Height gets to the nine. Someone has to inform Kenny Will Height when he goes into the end zone, it will come back to the line of scrimmage. So it remains a 16-point lead, and Doug Flutie warming up on the artificial surface at McMahon Stadium, getting set for another, well, we anticipate, classic matchup against the Edmonton Eskimos. What's that white stuff in the background? <laughs> hey, we saw a little bit here overnight in Baltimore. Looks like a little more in Calgary. The chill is on. Don Whitman, Danny Kepley, Scott Oak. I bet Scott's in the box, too. Yeah, he is. You know, Ken Austin would be down at field level if he wanted to. But... There's a swing pass out to Saunders, and he stretches out. Irv Smith with the contact on the fullback, who used to play for Don Matthews in Saskatchewan. You know, one of the unsung guys in the Baltimore secondary is Charles Anthony, who I feel is their best cover man. You see him that time playing Mark Stock on the inside, not allowing him to come off freely. He had to check off the Saunders in the flat. Second down three from the 16. Archer still has time, but he's got to turn this offense around. Dumps it off, and Saunders misses it, but a late hit. Grant Carter... And looks like Alfred Payton got to Archer after he released the ball. Well, you, you talk about he has time. He ran out of time and took a roughing penalty on that last play. Baltimore 54, 15 yards, first down. Grant Carter, as you call, but now David Archer has to take that penalty as you'll see Grant Carter come way late. He's way late on that play. But he has to take that penalty as it was a completed pass keeping the drive alive and build momentum from it. So instead of a punting situation, it's a first down, San Antonio at their own 32. It could turn out to be a big penalty. There's a knockdown, Carter makes up for it, getting his hands on the football. And hold on. Hey, Tempers you flaring. You got it all this afternoon. You got mud, you got big hits, and you got a little wrestling match going on out there. This is old-time football. This is the kind of game you could have played in, Chris. 
I don't know about that, but Demetrius is taking it to the max. Well, it, we can call it a hockey game on grass if you want, but you'll see Carter once again trying to get in there. He should have had that. Hit him in the hands, and most defenders this afternoon has let those get away. I don't know what the fireworks was all about after the nice play by Carter. No penalties, second and ten. Another tough shotgun snap. But Archer delivers, and Gamble has the catch. And David Gamble is going to carry a couple of defenders into Baltimore territory. So San Antonio still has life as they get it downfield. And the Texans in a fire offense with 9.42 to go. And once again, in between the hashes, this is where David Archer can have a lot of success if he continues to throw between the hash marks. 28 yards on that last play, and there's another one batted down by Carter. Big series for Grant Carter, two knockdowns after the roughing the passer penalty. As having an all-star series, Grant Carter is going to be right here at the top of your screen. Watch as he comes off. If you can't get to the passer, get your hands up in the air. Grant Carter times it perfectly. Once again, a bat down on this drive. And again, second down and 10 for Archer. Got to look over the middle. Here comes the rush. Open receiver Kendrick Taylor, but he won't get to the first down. Tracy Gravely was there. O.J. Brigitte's. And it will be third down. You got to gamble here, Chris. You don't have time to worry about another field goal attempt. You have to pick up the first down on a third down gamble because your season is on the line. It's third and about two and a half. Now, if David Archer is aware of what he has in front of him, he needs to half roll, throw the ball back. He'll pick up the first down. Utilize Mike Saunders right here. Four receivers left side. They've got to get to the 41. And flag goes down. Delay a game. Oh, what a tough time to take that penalty. And you wonder how you can get a delay a game and you don't even go into the huddle. You call the play from the line of scrimmage and it cost you five yards. Well, he tried to change the play. Actually, tried to call the play at the line, then they huddled, and then went back to the line. And that's a tough call now. It's third down. Stevenson sends in another play. And again, they have to get to the 41. Well, this is San Antonio's season right here in this one play. And David Archer is going to call timeout. He was down to seven seconds and he couldn't recognize what they had defensively. Baltimore calls a timeout on the play. But this is where he needs to go and confer with his head coach, make sure that everyone is on the right page, get the proper play call, and pick up this critical first down right here. We asked Keith Stevenson last week about why he makes all the play calls, and he says, I spent a lot more time than the quarterbacks and I have the help of the guys upstairs. Stevenson's there from 7 in the morning, sometimes till 2 in the morning. And I don't know if many people recognize that Kay Stevens played quarterback when he was at the University of Florida with the San Diego Chargers and Buffalo Bills. So he is very astute of what an offense should be able to do. And he's been a great asset for David Archer in his CFL career. 8-16 to go in the game, third and eight. Archer... And he's got a completion and a first down. Billy Hess picked that one up off the ground to move the sticks. And Chris, I want to point out one thing. That ball was thrown between the hash marks down the middle of the field. It was a catch. He got down under it. But if you stay in the middle of the field, you're going to have a chance to get completions. Tell you what, not everybody in this crowd is sure that he pulled that one off the turf. That time, I think Hess played deep hey, back. Right because if he doesn't knock that down, Tracy Grabley has got another interception for a touchdown like last week against Winnipeg. Well, David Archer tried to float that last pass 
Baltimore is playing a little soft defensively at this point. They've had problems in the last four games allowing teams to get back in the football game, and this is an opportunity for San Antonio, but they must get into the end zone on this drive. Baltimore's been outscored in the fourth quarter all year long, but they've never relinquished a third quarter lead. Archer on second down, and Gamble made the cut late. Archer threw that pass, and Gamble wasn't even looking. And they're forced into another critical third down play. 7.25 to go. That pass is already thrown. It was a late break by Gamble. He threw the ball on time. Gamble was squaring out. He was expecting him to come back. But Billy Hess was open at the 30-yard line, right over in front of the visa sign. Could have picked him up for another first down. Hess moved the sticks on the last third, Gamble. Let's see if he goes back to him. Pressure on. Open man, and he can't hang on. And San Antonio has turned it over on downs. Grant Carter applied the pressure. 7.02 to go. And Baltimore up by 15. Don Matthews' defense has held again, and they're now 7.02 away from, for Don Matthews, a return trip to Regina. But it's been the Grant Carter show here in the second half, putting pressure on David Archer, but almost a catch by Stock at the end. He laid out, but when he came, made contact with the ground, the ball came out. Very questionable non-call there. Mike Pringle fighting up to the 45, has five. And from a time point of view, James, this game is far from over. San Antonio, two scores and two two-point converts away from tying it. Six and a half minutes to go, but... Well, this season in the CFL, we've seen some of the most exciting action in the last three minutes. If we recall a game we did early in the year, CBC, BC and Edmonton, one of the most thrilling games that you'll ever see in a CFL where it went into overtime. Big defensive play needed here, and they've got it. Tracy Hamp dropped again behind the line of scrimmage. Roosevelt Collins, James King, they've had big afternoons. The front four has done a pretty good job for San Antonio, and they'll get the ball back again. Well, other than two situations where they allowed Tracy Hamp to escape outside for big yardage, those two defensive ends for San Antonio have done what you design a defensive scheme to do. Control a mobile quarterback such as Tracy Hamp, keep him in the pocket, now their offense needs to show some productivity. Miller kicking it downfield, and it kicked by Wilhite. And Kenny Wilhite found a little room up to the 21. Alvin Wolf, former Super Bowl winner in Washington with the tackle. Back in Baltimore, and this observation from the Stallions bench, a team official just told me that a lot of the defensive players have been coming off the field winded for some reason and asking for oxygen. His only theory is that this field is such a quagmire, it's taking a lot more energy to play on, almost like beach football, Chris. Well, let's find out if San Antonio can rally through the mud here. In the final five and a half minutes, he Sherman can't pull it in. I'll tell you what, James, if they're tired, David Archer has not been able to exploit it yet. Well, one of the things David Archer hasn't done is thrown the ball with any authority. He's trying to lob it. You have to go through your normal throwing motion when you're throwing the ball over the middle. Ken Austin made a living for years in Saskatchewan throwing those hot routes over the middle, exploiting the middle of the field. David Archer has not taken advantage of that opportunity this afternoon. Four receivers left for San Antonio. Here's the rush, and Archer flushed out and dropped. And there's Grant Carter again. I think that roughing the passer penalty only fired him up. Well, Grant Carter has been a house on fire from his defensive end position. David Archer's not going to outrun anybody, but 
Case Stevens said it best. When a defensive lineman goes upfield, when he comes back, he must retract his step, come back on the same plane. Grant Carter executed that perfectly, came up with the stop for the San Antonio quarterback. Todd Jordan's had a nightmare punting against the wind this afternoon. But it looks like it's coming back. Here's Wright. Down inside the 30, but the flag down. Todd Jordan was roughed up by Alvin Wolf. And another penalty is going to prolong a San Antonio drive. Just a 27-yard punt. but he's able to get it off and while he's still extended Walton makes the contact which is roughing the kicker because the leg was still extended but this is the second drive in succession that San Antonio has had penalties to keep the drive alive can David Archer find a way to get into the end zone he's had trouble all afternoon four and a half minutes left and David Archer still has to get in the end zone twice here's Mike Saunders up near midfield, forced out of bounds. Archer's pass. 4.20 to play. It's a 16-point deficit for San Antonio. And utilizes back Saunders out of the backfield. He's that go-to weapon when you need to pick up critical yardage, but he has to go vertical with the football. Here's that dump pass over the middle. Nice move there by Saunders and spins for another first down at the 43-yard line. Up Baltimore, O.J. Brigant's the tackle in San Antonio in the fire offense now as Jim Spiros, the Baltimore owner, looks on anxiously. Well, this is the soft part of, soft part of the Baltimore defense the underneath, and when it gets late in the game, they go into that deep cover two zone. Better protection, open receiver, Taylor with the catch, drilled out of bounds by Irv Smith. But San Antonio on three quick archer passes is now moving into scoring position with 3.37 to go. Is it too little or is it too late? David Archer has to get in within the next three plays. He needs to get into the end zone to give his offense another opportunity with time back on the field. Pressure on Archer's sidearm that almost picked off. And look who it was, Grant Carter again. I think Grant Carter might have David Archer on his Christmas list because he has had a couple of presents thrown his way this afternoon. He starts out at the right side of the formation, retracts himself, get back into the pass drop, and cover Mike Saunders coming out of the backfield. Great athletic effort by Grant Carter. Yeah, that's a linebacker play by a defensive end. And Alfred Payton's been shaken up. Alfred put the knee down, and now he's going off with 3.26 remaining here up north. Well, the calm before the storm, Wally Buono and Ron Lancaster. Two great CFL coaches ready to match wits again. Man. Probably discussing what they had for lunch. What a series that's been over the last few years. Hey, we might be in for a finish here. Second and ten. Saunders. And Saunders had to get over the 15, was turned back. And we've got another big third down play. Matt Goodwin wouldn't let Saunders get to the first down marker. The three-minute warning in Baltimore. Baltimore wants to get its hands on the Grey Cup. They just had it slip away a year ago. 
looking for a return trip, but uh, James, we've got a critical third down and one play here deep in Baltimore territory. And, and Baltimore has beefed up the defensive line. They brought in Robert Davis, who was their backup defensive lineman. They go on with three down linemen on this play, expecting San Antonio to run. East Sherman's in the backfield. Third and one. Sherman diving, and he gets over the 15 and should have it. 2.44 left on the clock. You know, but what David Archer has done in this drive is that he's burned up critical time. He has thrown the short passes, and they were effective. But that's what he should have been doing early in the game. We're going to see the dive played by Sherman as he goes over the top. But now, when do you go for the end zone? You're only 14 yards away. you got to take a couple shots at it. He'll take one now into the end zone, and incomplete. Billy Hess laid out for that and couldn't reel it in. You know, I, I like the shot of going into the end zone, but David Archer has had his success on this drive going over the middle. He's thrown the one completion to the outside, but the middle of the field is where David Archer's had most of his success. He's 21 of 41 on the day, 226 yards, most of them in the last 10 minutes. Five receivers out. And Archer throws another incompletion. That one should have been caught. Hess couldn't hang on near the first down stick. He would have had the first down, but third down and 10 once again, and he was let down by his receiver, Hess. You have to understand when you're in a game of this magnitude that every play is critical. That time, Billy Hess, lack of concentration. San Antonio now with third and 10. This is the game right here. Baltimore stops him. It's over. Time for Carter to dig in and Archer to reach into that bag of tricks. Archer throwing, complete at the five, and a flag goes down. Well, did he have the first down? Mark Stock with the catch at the five. Looked like he was close, and then the flag was dropped. I think we're going to get a defensive pass interference on the play, and it's going to be first down regardless. And so San Antonio still has life with 223 Major left. Foul, face mask, ball four, first down. Well, the face mask came, and so they also picked up another two yards after the reception. And so you have to continue to throw the ball. You'll see O.J. Brigance come in and grab Stock around the face mask, which he did not have the first down if he had just made the tackle. So it's now first and goal. And it's Archer throwing for Saunders. Can't hang on with Goodwin all over him. First and goal from the two, and he sent everybody out. But I, I think it was best that Saunders didn't make the reception because he would have been short of the end zone, and the clock would have continued to run. So it was an excellent play by Goodwin, but Archer is trying to go horizontal. He needs to go vertical, go straight down the field. He is chewing up valuable time and wasting down. Now, are they not running down in here because they don't want to... Waste valuable seconds. Well, this is also the soggy part of the field. Out inside the 20-yard lines is where all the tough treading comes. Second and goal. Anybody open? In the end zone, touchdown, Mark Stock. San Antonio has the first major of the day, and Key Stevenson calling for the two-point convert attempt. You know, I hate to be a stickler, Chris, but watch the mobility of David Archer. You'll see where this pass goes eventually. He buys himself the extra time, but where does he throw the ball? Right in between the hashes, right down the middle of the field. That's where his success has come from, and he hasn't done it consistently enough this afternoon. And just by the outstretched hands of Grant Carter. I mean, you talk about a defensive player that has played with his heart on the line this afternoon. Grant Carter has done it all for the Baltimore Stallions. Well, this is just about as critical as the touchdown play. Archer for two in the end zone, incomplete. And he's unconscious. He lost his helmet on that play. Let's hope that he's not seriously injured on that play. Looks like Billy Hess down on the play. 
And quickly, the staff is out to attend to Billy Hess, who was really charred in the end zone. You hate to see that sight when you're an athlete, another athlete going down, and he lost his helmet on that play, and let's hope for the best for Billy Hess on that play. He's had a game, a gainful game this afternoon, but that's very critical right there. The entire medical staff is attending to him on that play. A lot of concern from the players and the coaching staffs. You'll get another look right here as Billy Hess is working against Charles Anthony. As he comes in, three players collide right at the point of impact. You'll see the ball arrive, and three Baltimore Stallions arrive just with the ball. And he catches the knee in the head from Chris Johnson, the free safety, and it took his helmet off. But Billy Hess was unconscious right at that point. Let's hope for the best for Billy Hess. Medical staff out immediately. You know, football is a very violent game, and that was a completely clean hit. There was no malice intent on that play, but Billy Hess just going in, trying to make the reception to pick up the two-point conversion. 2-11 left in this one in regulation time. 21-11. But a prime concern right now is the condition of Hess. You know, we, we all look at sporting events and we think about the value of the game and, and what it means. And it's all, always meaningless when it comes down to a situation like this, when the health of a player is the major concern of everyone. You know, the football game becomes second, third seed at that time. Well, they continue to attend to Hess. And a similar occurrence happened to Jason Wallace, a defensive back for San Antonio a few weeks ago. He took a knee in the helmet, which took the helmet off in a game against Ottawa on a tackle against Sammy Garza. And Wallace was out of the lineup for a couple of weeks, a severe concussion. He's up on the play now, Chris. He's standing on his feet. And, that, and that's a great sight to see. You're going to get a roar from the fans here in Baltimore to appreciate the effort of Billy Hess this afternoon and his teammates from San Antonio. But it's great to see Billy walking off under his own power after that tenacious hit. Yeah, just 5'8", 175 pounds. Billy Hess, but he's been a player for San Antonio. Tuck receiver over the middle. Well, you get another look at it once again as Johnson's knee comes in just as Hess goes down trying to make that reception and his head snapped back and that's a frightening sight when you see something like that happen to an athlete that's good to see that he's going to be okay you know and situations like that can take the steam out of the engine for san antonio because they spent so much emotion on that drive and also worrying about their injured teammate on that play will they have anything left they're gonna line up for an onside uh kick attempt right here but what will the effect of that hess injury be for the rest of the game for the san antonio texans got another injured player shannon culver had dropped deep Cramp. and he is cramped up and that will delay proceedings a little longer. That goes back to the point where, where Mark had talked about players coming to the sideline asking for oxygen, that they were more spent than what you would expect with this heavy field this afternoon being all wet. And you get the extra sod up under your shoes and you're carrying around the extra weight has caused Culver to go down grasping his hamstring, possible cramps on the play. You know, Culver dropped deep, but I don't think there's a guy in the park that expects the ball to be kicked over 10, 15 yards. San Antonio all huddled. Their hands team is on. Well, Roman Anderson is an excellent kicker. He led the CFL in scoring this season. The first American kicker to do that as we get a look at that scoring drive. 14 plays on the scoring drive, but critical time was eaten up. Three minutes and 37 seconds. They needed to get down the field more efficiently. Now it's ever so critical that Roman Anderson can get a high hop on this kick and San Antonio can get down and recover because if they don't, Tracy Ham will run out the clock. 
Stock on the hands team now, wants to get his hands back on the football. Here we go. It's up for grabs. Batted out of bounds. Texans think they have it. And let's find out. The only indication that matters is from the official who says it's Baltimore football. Well, everybody on the far side of the field wearing white thought it was San Antonio ball. And let's see, has that one official been overruled? Well, it hasn't been overruled yet, but one of the complaints with Roman Anderson when he kicked the ball is that Roman Anderson was onside on the, on the ball. He had actually crossed the plane. As you see the ball go up in the air right there, and it's really unclear who hit the ball, but that was a great effort by the San Antonio kick cover team. I think Chris Wright was the man who batted it down, and out of bounds, it's Baltimore football at the San Antonio 50. Pringle has a hole and a first down. Jason Wallace, the tackle, but a huge first down for Mike Pringle with 2.03 to go. And power football when it counts. What the stallion tradition has been built on is the running game of Mike Pringle and the power of their offensive line. When needed, they've been able to pick up their critical yardage. First down game on first down. And over 100 yards again. And remember, Baltimore 16-1 and when Pringles reached the century mark rushing in a game. They'll call his number now in the dying minutes, and Mike Pringle has another first down. At the 21, Miller the tackle, but it's a pickup of 17. Robert Grubman and Neil Fort did outstanding job to Mike Pringle on that counterplay. You can always talk about Mike Pringle yards, but it starts at the point of attack. The big right off at the tackle and the fullback pulled around, kicked out to the left. Mike Pringle once again gaining another Baltimore first down. First down, Baltimore. Chewing up yards in the clock, Pringle again. Down at the 13-yard line. 1-11 to go, and Baltimore confirming reservations for Taylor Field and Regina next Sunday. It is so easy to understand why Mike Pringle has got his second nominee as outstanding player in the CFL. When the game is on the line, you can give him the ball and expect the best from Mike Pringle, and he has been able to, to deliver this afternoon and all season. 169 yards in total. 134 on the ground, 35 through the air. Guys like Neil Fort, Dixon, and Subas with a cone have sprung the holes. But Pringle can do a lot on his own just with that power. A, a great power back, but when you go back and you look at this game this afternoon, Chris, you're really going to have to go back and give a tribute to Tracy Ham. Tracy Ham, the quarterback for the Baltimore Stallions, has stepped up when called upon. He's been maligned all year long. He's always been overlooked for other quarterbacks when it came to all-star nomination. But Tracy Ham is your team player. He is the guy that they felt when they developed this organization here in Baltimore. He was the trigger man that they wanted. First down, Pringle. I think we're going to get a holding penalty on the plate that's going to negate that touchdown run by Mike Pringle. But a great effort to get into the end zone by Mike Pringle, even with the penalty called on the plate. The marker flew just as Pringle crossed the line. Dave Ewell's going to bring it back. Holding, Baltimore 64. 10 yards, first down. Mark Dixon, player of the week last week on that Baltimore offensive line. 21 seconds to go. But back to my point about Tracy Ham. Tracy Ham has done all the right things this afternoon that you expect from your quarterback. 
in a championship game. He has kept the opposing offense off the field. Everyone has talked about the high-powered offense of San Antonio and David Archer, but he didn't have a chance to display his talents this afternoon because of Tracy Ham. And Ham now is going to kill as much time as possible. And again, tempers erupting. That's Maurice Miller. Pounding it away at Subas, the center. Check that, George Bethune. Well, the frustration of the San Antonio players starting to show. It's been a hard-fought battle, but Baltimore, a great team, has played itself proud this afternoon in its second consecutive trip to the Grey Cup. They're trying to cool Subas down. Well, I think he'll be cool enough next week in Regina, but that's what he should be excited about is the trip to Regina, Saskatchewan, and Taylor Field next Sunday, 4 o'clock Eastern, or is that 5 o'clock Eastern? Break up in Regina. Now the penalty called, and now being marched off. Stopped the clock with 16 seconds to go. George Bethune, former Blue Bomber, He's had a big year. Is headed off the field, and Tracy Ham saying, "Let's just stick to business." Well, this came down between power of football and experience. The power of Baltimore's offensive line, the experience of Tracy Ham at quarterback, and the tenaciousness of the Baltimore defense corralling the San Antonio offense all afternoon. He goes down, and the next play will be the final one of this Southern final. They were the team, well there's David Archer, and guy that's been with this organization for three years, and they built the team around him, but it's not to be in 95. There's the other quarterback that the team was built around, Tracy Ham, who is gonna get all the accolades for directing his team this afternoon to the Grey Cup. They were the team with no name last year that went to the Grey Cup. The team with no home is going back to the Grey Cup in 95. I am 21. That is 21. It's party time. The have now advanced to the Grey Cup championship game in Regina, Saskatchewan. The game will be Don Matthews next said Sunday. anything the short of a Grey Cup will be a disappointment. Be sure he gets a chance to go back and finish the job. In his old stopping grounds, Taylor Field. Well, I think they all felt that they had a lot of unfinished business from last season. A very disappointing loss in BC Place last year on that great game and run by the BC Lions, culminated with the Louis Pasaglia field goal. But they were a team of destiny for the second year to come out with the best record in the CFL tie in Calgary. But 15 3, Daryl Adrojan. The special team coach, I think you really have to look at him possibly as being the most valuable member of this team. He controls the special teams. Chris Wright, Josh Miller, Carlos Wetzel all led the league in their distinctive category this season. And that was the true difference in the development of the Baltimore Stallions this year over last season. All right, let's go down to the field and join Mark. Thanks, guys. We're uh, on the field with Mike Pringle. Mike, this is beginning to... Be a habit here talking with you after big games like this. You're going to the cup for the second year in a row. How do you feel? Oh, great. For the second year in a row, definitely. Uh, defense came out and played excellent. Offense did his job when he had when, when it had to, and everything came together. Um, I couldn't ask for anything better. Tough game out there. You got a heck of a fat lip there. Oh, yeah, that was the first play of the game, and uh, trying to cover it so everybody wants to see it. But <laughs> yeah, number 55, I'm forget his name. He came and really put it on me. So I guess I'm going to have to stay home. I can't go out tonight and uh, go to clubs and stuff, so I got to hide my lip. <laughs> Tell me about this team. That's 12 wins in a row going into the Great Cup game. This may be your final game in Baltimore. What kind of emotion is on this club? Oh, it's definitely a lot of emotion. We wanted to go out with it. Hopefully, we're not going out. You know, it was the most important game, more, more than this is the game that gets you to the Great Cup. This is what you fight for all offseason. This is why you go through all the um, hard work on offseason and go through all the BS during the season to get to the Great Cup. And this was a game that we wanted to leave everything out of the field, and I think we did just that. There's a sign outside Camden Yards that says, Unfinished Business. 
There's Mike Saunders congratulating Mike Pringle. It says unfinished business. Is that how this team feels? I know how disappointed you were last year in Vancouver to lose. Um, definitely. It's unfinished, unfinished business, but last year was last year. This is completely do, new, new team, a new season. We're not going into break up thinking about last year. We're going to go out there and play 60 minutes of football and uh, hopefully come out and bring the great, uh, great cup back to Baltimore. All right, Mike, thanks for your time. Congratulations. Your public is waiting. All right, Mike Pringle of the Baltimore Stallions with a big win here today. Let's go upstairs to Chris and James. Well, Larry Smith is presenting the trophy. Symbolic of the South Division title. And Don Matthews. Well, that trophy was first presented in 1912, and for the first time in CFL history, it is presented on American soil. The Baltimore Stallions are the champions of the South and headed north to Taylor Field in Virginia.